My name is Will Inboden, Executive Director of the Clement Center and a distinguished fellow at the Strauss Center. The two organizations, along with the LBJ School, that are very honored to host you here and host our talk from our special guest, Tom, Tom Ricks, today. Uh, before I introduce Tom, a uh, brief housekeeping item. Um, one of our honest and honorable guests here brought to our attention that someone left this, uh, a, a nice pen and a little blue notebook out at the coffee table, so these belong to you. Um, let's, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> there you go, Jim. All right. I rifled through it. There wasn't any cash in the thing. So. Um, anyway, our guest speaker today uh, is really one of those who needs very little in the way of introduction. I'm sure he's, uh, his work is very well known to uh, just about everyone in here. Uh, I think I can say that Tom Ricks is really a must read for any of us interested in defense policy and national security policy. Uh, he is a contributing editor at Foreign Policy Magazine where he writes and produces the uh, the best, the widely read best defense blog. Um, he's also a fellow at the Center for uh, New American Security. And what's your position at New America Foundation? Uh, National Security Advisor. And National Security Advisor for the uh, for the New New America Found New America Foundation. One slight amendment. Um, nothing against the Washington Post, but Tom informed me he no longer no longer has a formal affiliation with the Post. But hey, we're happy to give the Post some credit for him anyway. So um, anyway, he's the author of uh, many books, two uh, pretty authoritative uh, first cut histories of the Iraq War fiasco, fiasco followed by the gamble. Um, and most recently, the book he's going to be speaking to us about today is The Generals, American Milita Military Command from World War II to today. And the man over my shoulder here, General Marshall, plays a prominent role in that. So Tom will talk for about 35 to 45 minutes, after which we'll uh, open it up for Q&A, and he'll, he'll moderate that so we look forward to hearing from him and having a good discussion afterwards. Please join me in welcoming Tom Ricks. Thank you. 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 Thank
Bureaucracies excel at one thing, almost by definition, and that is defending themselves. In fact, you might say that's what a bureaucracy is optimized to defend its interest and itself. How does a bureaucracy do this? Number one, bureaucracies are built to absorb criticism. They have the pain threshold of a slot. <laughs> Number two, they have time. They can outweigh you. I have actually heard people in the Pentagon say this to me at times. Eh, this Rumsfeld guy, he's going to be gone in two years. The U.S. Army is still going to be here. We can wait him out. Number three, while they are bad at changing, they are wonderful at pretending to change. <laughs> you will find that when you propose changes in your bureaucracy, they will take gratefully all the language you propose and none of the ideas. I remember a few years ago reading a defense authorization bill at a time where there was some concern about the defense industrial base. Every single item in the in defense authorization bill was justified by the defense industrial base. At one point, MREs, the inedible military rations, um, also known as um, meals ready for Ethiopians. Um, <laughs> MREs were justified by the, um, as part of the, the food industrial base. So they will borrow your terms and label whatever they are doing as the hot new thing you are proposing. You want innovation? Fine, we're innovative. If you want adaptiveness? Fine, we're adaptive. How do you deal with this? You don't have a lot of tools. You don't have time. You don't have their power. You don't have their huge staff to churn out and inundate you with papers like a good criminal defense attorney will do to the prosecutor. All you have is the wonderful tool of truth, speaking truth to power. You can leverage a giant bureaucracy with sunlight. It's ineffable, but sunlight is the disinfectant will open up and show them things. And this is why I have this guy's photograph up here. George Marshall not only spoke truth to power, he made a career of speaking truth to power. He should be better known. He was a quiet, reserved man, not a friendly man. But his core characteristic was honesty. From early in his career, he got one of the best OERs I've ever read for an officer. In 1913, he was serving in Utah, and the officer evaluation form at, at that point had a question at the end, would you like to have this officer serve under your command again? And his commander wrote, yes, but I would prefer to serve under him. <laughs> That's an honest, true dealer, a plain dealer. In World War II, he went over to France, one of the first officers to land, American officers to land in France. He was a major. And he had a confrontation with the American commander in France, General Blackjack Pershing. You mean World War I? I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, World War I, sorry. He's, uh, he, he's over there, he's a major. They're trying to organize what they call the, the division. It was called the division because it was the first division ever sent overseas by the U.S. military. It later became known as the infantry division, and then later became known as the first infantry. And Marshall came to see them. I'm sorry. I'm not, still not quite awake for some reason. Okay. Pershing came to see them in their exercises and was very unhappy with what he saw. Uh, officers didn't know their roles. The tactics were not up to speed. Uh, generally, it was a mess. And Pershing, a very direct man, said so publicly to a group of officers, including the division commander, General Seaver. He turned to leave, and Major Marshall did something that I don't recommend to you captains. <laughs> he reached out and he grabbed Pershing by the arm, and he said, there's something you have to hear, General. And Pershing says, I've seen all I need to see and heard all I need to hear. And Marshall says, no, you haven't. Let me tell you about some of the problems induced by your staff on us. The problems we are having are partly caused by you and your people. And he laid it out. Pershing listened and then left, and Marshall's friends gathered around him to console him on a brilliant but short career. 
to everyone's surprise, the next time Pershing showed up at the division, he asked to see Marshall. He was still a tough guy. He fired the division commander, Siebert. Um, and uh, Siebert's son, by the way, was fired in World War II, uh, making them the only, I know, uh, double uh, firing of generals in combat. <laughs> by the end of World War I, Marshall and Pershing were very close. In fact, Marshall went on to become the uh, basically staff, <laughs> chief staff, chief of staff for Pershing for several years. Both men lost their first wives, Pershing tragically in a fire that killed his family as well. And when both men remarried, they were best men at each other's weddings. Marshall continued on with his habit of speaking truth to power. Douglas MacArthur didn't like him and kind of exiled him to a National Guard job in Chicago. But after MacArthur stepped down to chief of staff and went off to the Philippines, Marshall rose more quickly. In 1938, he was a brigadier general and he was in the Oval Office at a meeting about military readiness with the President, Roosevelt, and several other officials. Marshall wasn't asked to say much. At the end of the meeting, President Roosevelt sensing that um, Marshall quite, wasn't quite on board, looked over and said, George, you agree with this, don't you? And Brigadier General Marshall made two things clear to President Roosevelt. Number one, his first name was General, not George. They were not pals. Number two, no, he didn't agree, and he explained why. Once again, people gathered to, get, to con console Marshall on the end of his career. But Roosevelt was a very good politician and leader. He was a world-class Machiavellian. He was a world-class bullshitter. And he knew that a world-class bullshitter in public life needs somebody to throw the bull bullshit flag on him. And so, <laughs> A year later, when it came time to pick the Army Chief of Staff, Roosevelt passes over the obvious choice, the senior guy, Yu Drum. Instead, picks this Marshall guy, this crusty guy, kind of a distant crustiness to him. Marshall doesn't give up speaking truth to power. He's named Chief of Staff and becomes formerly Chief of Staff on September 1, 1939. A few months later, he's in the Oval Office again. Once again, Roosevelt kind of is trying to roll them all. And Marshall, at the end of the meeting, says, may I have a few minutes, Mr. President? And he stands over the disabled president, looking down on him, and says, if you don't do something today, Mr. President, I fear for the future of the world. And Secretary of the Treasury Morgenthau, who was present at the meeting, later wrote that he thought that was the day that changed Roosevelt on military readiness. It had to do with some specific questions on how to build up the Army Air Force quickly. Roosevelt wanted to go just with 10,000 aircraft at a time when the Army Air Force had about 200. And Marshall wanted a more balanced plan, and Marshall kind of talked, to, talked him into that. So George Marshall was a good man. He was a great man. He was not a nice man. And this is going to be the theme of the next part of this talk, what that means how he handled people. Before becoming Army Chief of Staff in the summer of 39, he sat down with a smart young colonel named Matthew Ridgway. And they spent about 10 days talking and thinking about the future of the Army. And one of the things they decided was they wanted to get rid of about 600 officers that they called a dead word. This was well before the U.S. entry into World War II. He got rid of, the, rid of those 600 officers, and it actually brings to mind one of the best sayings I've heard about generals. The most important thing a general can do is the things he does before a battle. In this case, the most important thing an army chief of staff could do were the things he did before a war. Marshall begins in 39, preparing the U.S. Army for World War II. They begin a very rapid expansion. They start moving up younger officers quickly. They give people a lot of tests. Marshall has his eye on several younger guys across the military. He has thought about this for 20 years. He has thought, number one, we're going to go to war unprepared. So I need optimistic, determined officers. Number two, we're going to be fighting overseas. That means we're going to be fighting alongside allies. That means I need people who can get along. That means Patton's a great field commander, but Patton will not be. 
somebody I want working with Alex. <coughs> and among the officers he has his eye on is the executive officer of an infantry regiment based in Vancouver, Washington, <coughs> Lieutenant Colonel Dwight D. Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower is not his only choice. He has about four or five guys he starts putting to test and moving up quickly. And Eisenhower passed these tests. My favorite story about Eisenhower is a week after uh, Pearl Harbor. He is actually at Fort Sam Houston, not far from here. And he gets a phone call. It's actually the Friday after. He gets a phone call and uh, it says, uh, Ike, the chief wants you up there. Get up here as soon as you can. It's, a ter it's terrible weather that December day. And um, Eisenhower tries to fly and the planes are not flying. The commercial flights are not flying. The Blue Bonnet Express, the last train east for the night, has left. So he gets an army pilot to fly him along the tracks low until they catch up with the Blue Bonnet Express. They wave it down, <laughs> land the plane on the field. He gets onto the train. It's full because people are rushing around the country as war has begun. And so newly minted Brigadier General Eisenhower at this point is sitting in Mufti on his suitcase in, the, um, in an aisle. And a lawyer he knows from San Antonio comes up and says, Colonel Eisenhower, what are you doing sitting on this suitcase? And Ike explains, I don't have a seat. And the lawyer, who happens to be traveling with a big Texas oil man, Murchison, says, well, my boss has a whole car in the back. Come on back. So Ike plays poker with these two guys for two days and gets, drinks their good bourbon. Arrives uh, on Sunday the 14th at Union Station in Washington. His brother Milton picks him up. Milton later goes on to become president of Johns Hopkins, by the way. Brother Milton picks him up and drives him over to Marshall's office, which is in a Quonset hut, where the Vietnam Memorial now stands. The two men don't know each other well. Marshall's been tracking the guy, but only has had one two-minute conversation with him. That Sunday morning, Ike walks in. Marshall looks up and says, Ike, glad you're here. Tell me how to fight the war in the Pacific. Eisenhower says, how long do I have? Marshall says, this afternoon. OK, says I. And he sits down and he writes a three-page memo. Now, this is not rocket science, because the Army and the Navy have been discussing this for 10 years. The war colleges are attached, and this is a good idea that we lost. The war colleges are directly attached to the fives, the planning staffs of the services. They work for the services on planning. And both the Navy War College and the Army War College have been going through what are called the rainbow plans. And this is, what do we do, war plan red, what do we do if the British invade, and so on. War plan orange is the key one. What do we do with the war with Japan? And several key decisions have been made. Ike encapsulates these. He knows, especially plan dog, the key Navy plan. And he says, first, you must abandon the Philippines. Well, this was a key question for Marshall. Ike had spent several years in the Philippines. Some of his best friends were there. He had been MacArthur's chief of staff until MacArthur fired him. Wow, Ike was on vacation and didn't tell him. He probably had an affair there. But Ike condemns all these former friends and comrades and perhaps lovers the Japanese occupation. He says, we can't defend the Philippines. You've got to pull back. You've got to keep open your sea lines of communication to Australia, and that will be the base from which you respond to Japanese aggression. That afternoon, Marshall comes back from actually going to see Pershing, reads it, and looks up and says, this is fine. Tell me how to implement it. And that's his second task of the day. Ike passes these tests and rises up quickly. During World War II, 155 men commanded army divisions in combat. Of the 155, 16 were fired from command in combat. That's a firing rate, a relief rate of more than 10%. And this is after they've passed several hurdles. Will you be given a division? Will you be allowed to train it up and then take it overseas? Will you be allowed to continue training it overseas and take it into battle? And then you're in battle and you get relieved. But of the 16 who were fired, five were given other divisions in combat later in the war. So while relief was swift, it was not terminal. But basically, in World War II, George Marshall was going to give you 
about 90 days to succeed, get killed or wounded, or get moved out. If you succeeded, you'd get promoted. One regimental commander lands in Normandy in June 40, uh, 44. A year later, he's a corps commander. We're up, rising up very quickly from regiment, division to corps. This system, I would submit to you, is accountability. And I would also submit to you, we have lost our hold on it. We don't have accountability like we used to under the Marshall system. Why is this important? First of all, because it's important that you reinforce success and don't reward failure. It's also important, and this goes to today's military, because accountability leads to adaptiveness. One of the key aspects of the U.S. military in World War II is we went in very green. It was a blessing that we actually fought the French first in Africa, because well, some of them kicked our butts. Then we fought the Germans in Africa, when they were in a very difficult situation logistically. Only then did we go in and fight the Germans in Europe when their air cover was much weaker than it was a year earlier. Had we landed on the beaches, which Marshall wanted in 43, I think we would have had a terrible time had we landed in Normandy. A much stronger German force with much better air cover. We had total air superiority in Normandy in 44. So we had a steep learning curve, but it was a good learning curve. One of the comments that Bernard Lewis, now known as an analyst in the Middle East, but in World War II, a British intelligence officer, one of the observations he made was the Americans made a terrific number of mistakes, and number two, they didn't repeat them. Whereas the British military kind of really declines in military effectiveness, uh, 42, 43, 44. They're tired. They're beat up, and they are not a learning organization. The Americans are a learning organization. I would say the key to this was success is rewarded, and it makes people adaptive. The result of this, who here knows the name Lloyd Fredendahl? OK, this is actually, you guys are doing better than some of the other audiences I've spoken to. Lloyd Fredendahl was the top American commander in the field early in the war in North Africa. He was fired and replaced by people whose names you do know. Who here knows? Here's an even tougher one. Our Air Force guys might know it. Major General James Cheney, C H A N E Y. He was the American commander in Britain before a guy named Eisenhower. Marshall grew unhappy with how Cheney was operating, didn't think he had a sense of urgency to him. And General Cheney wound up World War II commanding a boot camp in Wichita Falls. His successor wound up President of the United States. So we do know these names. Matthew Ridgway, Dwight Eisenhower, Jim Gavin. These are the guys who rose up quickly in the Marshall system. You could go from a lieutenant colonel to a four star in three and a half years in this system. Two reasons, though, for this system that we lost. Number one, we were fighting an existential war, a war for the future. <clears throat> and number two, we were, it was a rapidly expanding force. When uh, Marshall takes over the Army, which includes the Army Air Force, it's about 200,000 people in 1939. When he steps down, it's 8.5 million. That's personnel turbulence. You could not throw away any officer who could walk and chew gum at the same time was going to get some sort of job. And if you could walk, chew gum, and think at the same time, you were going to do better. The second thing is we start getting into small, messy, difficult wars, where it's much harder to know what success looks like. The big change comes in Korea. It turns out it is much harder to relieve people in wars like Korea. Matthew Ridgway finds this out the hard way. He is sent in at the end of 1950 to clean up the mess that MacArthur has made of Korea. MacArthur is panicking, wants to use 25 nuclear weapons against China. He's also saying we might need to leave the peninsula immediately, abandon it. He's flip-flopping all over the place. Ridgway goes in and cleans house. He sends a note to the Army Chief of Staff saying he plans to fire 
five of the six division commanders and half the regimental commanders in Korea. And he starts doing it. He gets a rocket back from Wade Hayslip, the vice chief of staff of the army. And it's a, it's, I've actually read this in the, arm, in the army's uh, archives at Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It's a funny note. Basically, Hayslip says, look, I know you want to fire people, but you're going to keep it on the down low. This war is a mess. Congress is asking a lot of questions. So what you're going to do is disguise this. You're going to say we had planned rotations. Well, they can't do that with the first guy he's fired, because the first guy he's fired has only been a commander of a division four weeks. But the other guys, they find places to park them. And um, Hayslip says, and look, Matt, you're going to have to lie about this, because Joe Collins, the Army Chief of Staff, is already up on the hill lying about it. You've got to back up the story. <laughs> and so this tradition of public relief of uh, punishing failure, rewarding success, be begins to crumble under the political pressure of the Korean War. In Vietnam, the martial tradition is entirely lost. Third quiz of the day. Anybody ever hear of Major General James Baldwin? No? Neither did 900 officers I spoke to at Leavenworth. Major General James Baldwin is the only Army General, the only Army Division Commander, fired in the Vietnam War. I would submit to you that the Army generals of the Vietnam War were not ten times better than the Army generals of World War II. So what's going on? Nobody's getting fired except Baldwin. Not even the general who oversees the My Lai Massacre and who was found by the Army investigators to almost certainly have committed felonious acts in the destruction of evidence and the cover-up of the killings. Not even Samuel Acosta, commander of the Americal Division, is fired for court martial. He is superintendent of West Point when his crimes are discovered by the Army. They, were, they live, move him out of that job as superintendent, and um, they demote him back to one star. And they send him to Aberdeen, the proving ground in Maryland. Ever since then, whenever I learned that, when I see an officer transferred to Aberdeen, I wonder, well, what did he do? <laughs> And so we have the Vietnam system still in place. The Army did a lot of great things after Vietnam to rebuild itself, restructure itself. They had a tactical revolution that made them much better. The one thing they did not fix was the head on top of the body, generalship. I believe the Army lost its hold on generalship in Vietnam and has still not recovered it. Being an Army general today, is a lot like being a professor at a university with tenure. You can be bad at your job as long as you don't embarrass the institution. You can keep it. Nobody's going to pay a lot of attention to performance as long as you keep your pants on. So we see generals today fired for zipper problems, for personnel, personal problems. But you don't see generals fired a lot for failure to command in the field. The reason firing of a couple of Marine generals was a real exception to this, and I think harkens back to the Marines' nautical traditions. The Marines are part of the Department of the Navy. The Navy has a far different tradition of command. If you're in charge of the ship, you're responsible for everything that happens, even if you're asleep at the time. But the Army has lost this. We have had a generation of often mediocre generals. They do not think strategically. They think that's someone else's job. Tommy Franks, my exhibit A in this discussion. Tommy Franks, in his memoirs, talks about the 50-pound brains he has as colonels who do his thinking for him. When I read that, I felt like screaming. I thought, the first job of a general is to think. You don't outsource your thinking any more than you outsource leadership of your unit. It is your job. You don't get somebody else to do it for you. So for example, General Tommy R. Franks thought, Taking the enemy's capital means I've won. He does this not once, but twice. You don't get offered a chance to screw up two wars. First, he takes Kabul and thinks he's won. And, for added pleasure, he thinks that pushing Al-Qaeda into Pakistan is a good idea. Because his, his orders say, get rid of Al-Qaeda, get Al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan. And so he pushes them into a country with nuclear weapons. Not a good idea, General Franks. Then he does essentially the same thing in Baghdad. He takes Baghdad and spikes the ball on the 30-yard line. 
at which point the enemy decides to begin fighting its, its war. To conclude, we know what discipline looks like in an enlisted soldier. He or she looks you in the eye, takes care of his or herself, takes responsibility and initiative, and is squared away. Discipline. But I don't think we as a public or as a Congress know what a disciplined general looks like. And here are some characteristics that I would propose from my research. <coughs> Eight characteristics that I see of a disciplined general. Number one, he or she enforces standards, mental as well as physical. I see a lot of generals who enforce physical standards, but are kind of clueless about mental standards. They don't know how to think critically. Number two, he or she is willing to criticize other generals as part of that privately, including superior officers, privately, not publicly. Number three, he or she speaks truth to power. Not always. You don't want to make yourself the person who always, you know, has a problem. But if you sincerely believe that this is the wrong course for the nation to be embarking upon, it is not just a good idea to speak up, it's your duty. And so, when you do not speak truth to power, you are not doing your duty. It won't be good for your career, necessarily. I'm not saying nobody's going to say, oh, he's speaking truth to power. No, they're going to hate you. But you've got to do it sometimes. And in the long run, they appreciate it. Somebody, a marshal, or I was talking earlier, a Brent Scowcroft, who, despite a lot of personal damage, spoke truth about the Iraq War, even as a retired general. Four, he cares more about his soldiers, his service, than he does about his career. Something that was very important to George Marshall. A couple of times when he came across officers who appeared to care more about their career, their next assignment, than taking care of their people and doing their mission, he fired them. He did it very quickly. He fired an old friend over the phone. When the friend said, can't, uh, I can't leave for France because my house is packed up and my wife's out of town. He said, did you seriously say that? And the guy said, yeah. He said, very well, you are retired as of tomorrow. He disciplines himself mentally. He doesn't complain about a lack of bandwidth. A general who tells you, and I hear this all the time, oh, I really don't have the bandwidth for everything that's coming at me. No, general, you lack the discipline to sort things out. Do only the things that only you can do, get subordinates to do the other things, push power downward, make priorities. Prioritization is the essence of strategy. If you don't have enough bandwidth, it makes you're not making decisions about what to do and what not to do. Number six, he empowers his subordinates and protects them, even when they make mistakes, as long as they are learning and not repeating those mistakes. Except on moral issues, issues of integrity, which are instantly should be dealt with. And two things on retirement. Number one, when he retires, he does not go to work in the defense industry. He doesn't say, it's my turn to cash in. Marshall, was all, Marshall had no money. He lived on his salary. He paid close attention to it. I looked through his desk letter, actually, at the Marshall archives. He paid attention to taxi receipts, uh, things of small cost, because he didn't have a lot of money. Henry Luce, who on Time Life offered to make him a rich man, offered him a million dollars for his memoirs of World War II. Marshall turned it down, saying, I either have to lie or to hurt a lot of people's feelings, and I don't want to do either of those things. Number eight, in retirement, he stays out of politics. Marshall famously did not vote. Oh, I suspect his sentiments as a graduate of VMI were rather Republican. But he served Democrats loyally and well, to the point that Harry Truman almost worshipped him and called, I think, on Marshall too much. By the time Marshall was made Secretary of Defense briefly in the early 1950s, he was no longer George Marshall. He was an exhausted man. He was an old man. And it was the wrong thing to do. He said, I'll do it for one year, and then I want you to make Bob London uh, my Secretary of Defense, and, uh, and I need to move on. And by within a couple of years, it was clear that Marshall was suffering um, from Alzheimer's. At one point, a young State Department officer named Dean Rusk tries to talk Marshall into staying as Secretary of Defense. And Marshall almost angrily says, I can't remember the names of some of my old friends. It's time to step down. 
in retirement staying out of politics, one footnote, that doesn't mean general shouldn't vote. He can even go out and endorse people. But if he's going to endorse people, it should be as Joe Smith, not as Major General Joe Smith, U.S. Marine Corps, retired. Because he's dragging his service into the arena of politics. He is not doing his service a favor. If I were king for a day, I'd have each of the service chiefs send a letter to all the retired flag officers. And they know who these guys are. They stay in touch. And say, Jets, stay out of politics. You can endorse people, put your name on it. Just don't drag our service into it. And most of all, don't stand up behind presidential candidates like potted plants at the conventions. This is not what I want out of my services, they would say. So to conclude, everybody wants to support the troops. It's a cliche to the point that the troops are sick of it. As one friend of mine said, you can go hang yourself with that yellow ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really want to support the troops, there are things that we could do better. We can hold their leaders accountable. This begins with the Congress. The Congress won't hold leaders <coughs> accountable unless people ask them to. Yes, our wars today are small and unpopular. But Matthew Ridgway showed, and I believe General Petraeus showed in Iraq, that it is possible to go one of these small wars and do things better than they have been done. And I believe that a soldier blowing up an IED in Helmand province is every bit as dead as one machine gun by the Germans on Omaha Beach, and every bit as deserving of good leadership. That's it. You can see now why John Stewart calls me a little Mr. Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs>